Okay, guys, uh, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Uh, we're going to talk tonight a little bit about uh, V-carb inlays, and we've got a guest uh, that's uh, offered to uh, answer some questions for guys that have had problems with it or anything about uh, anything about that. We'll see if we can help you out. Um, we've got Sean Gano. Is that how you pronounce your last name, Gano? Yes. Okay, yeah. and Sean is from Houston. Texas works for NASA, and why don't uh, you go ahead and introduce yourself? And I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to you, Sean, and then you can uh, put up your screen, and um, and we'll go from there. All right. Okay. So if you're if you guys aren't getting your uh, everybody else, turn your mic off. And if you're not getting uh, a full screen, be sure to go and enlarge your screen. And then that will give you a, a full presentation on your computer. Uh, is the slides coming through? The first thing? Yeah, I can see the V-carb inlay text. All right. Sure. Good. All right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sean Gano, and I uh, am originally from Niles, Michigan. So I guess that's kind of my uh, link to the group. <laughs> So to speak, and yeah, now I live in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, so I was asked to talk about the V-carve inlay technique today. So I'm definitely not the expert, but uh, over but for Christmas I made a set of coasters with uh, inlays for all of the family. So that's kind of how I have my experience in doing that. So I had made plenty of uh, mistakes uh, then, but after making so many of them, I kind of learned the process pretty well. And so that's why I created the video that's on YouTube. So that's kind of where I came from. So I'm sure uh, I could learn plenty of things on this from you guys as well. But this is sort of uh, what I learned. So, uh, Sean, um, can you tell them, uh, can you give them the address or maybe put the address on the screen of where the, or, or um, I can do it later, of where, how they can get the video? There we go. Sure. So if you have your cell phone there, you can take a picture of the QR code, and it'll take you right there, or there's a link below. And I can uh, send you a copy of the slides afterwards, too, if you guys are interested. Or if you uh, just go to YouTube and search search uh, V-Carve Inlays, you'll either get my video or the one by uh, Dave Van Antwerp, which is also really uh, good. And then there's a couple other uh, V-Carve Inlay videos that are also uh, listed here below that. I used a lot in kind of learning the process. And Sean, Dave's in the Dave's in the room, so he can uh, yeah. help answer some questions, maybe. <laughs> That's right. Oh okay, yeah, so I have uh, the the presentation kind of goes over a lot of the parts that are similar to the video. Uh, we can either go through parts that are boring to people, or I can go through more detail, kind of. So just kind of based on what you guys are interested in. Uh, so in the video, I go over kind of the overview of the process, a little bit of theory of why it works and how it's different than regular inlays, uh, a little bit of CAD CAM, uh, Vectrix uh, software, and then a little bit on the, the machining part of it. But the real trick that's different than most things is kind of the CAM, how you set it up. Uh, and then things that are not in the video, some things I learned the hard way, and then uh, other inlay materials I experimented with. and and making these posters so that you guys might find interesting. <laughs> All right, so the overview is uh, the V-carved inlays are quite a bit different than traditional inlays and in that they have kind of a wedge shape to the edges and they're not vertical sides like uh, traditional inlays that are made with uh, straight bit routers. Uh, the advantages of that is you can create complex inlays with a lot of sharp corners uh, quite a bit easier. And uh, they can also have multiple parts where you can glue them all up at the same time you can have like a backing to all of the parts. And then also because of that well, wedge shape when you're inserting the inlay, uh, you can have, uh, if you glue it on a slightly different wrong angle or you machine it slightly off, uh, you just keep on pushing down harder and then that wedge shape will fill up all of the gaps. And so it makes the inlays look pretty spectacular even if you made some mistakes. So that's kind of the way I liked it. <laughs> Cover up all my uh, uh, errors. Uh, the kind of the disadvantages are it's a little more complex to set up, uh, but once you get used to it, 
but it's not really uh, extremely complex. So you just uh, just a little bit of a few things to to learn, and then you're over that hump. And then uh, in practice, it really requires a CNC machine. I guess you could do this by hand, uh, but it would be very tricky if you wanted a really complex uh, design. All right, so the theory I can go through this is that this is kind of the slides I used in, in the uh, video, but I'll go through this. If it gets boring, just let me know. I'll try to go through it fairly quick. But if you have questions, just stop me anytime. Uh, so this, this is just a quick view of what it looks like when you do a V-carve. Uh, you end up with a slot that has this uh, kind of chamfered sides or angled sides. And uh, kind of if you take a quick look at that, or a close look at that angled side, uh, and you chop a line right down the middle between the flat bottom and the top, and then you take the top part and you flip it over, you'll notice that uh, it's the perfect fit. So it fits kind of right in that slot. And so kind of with that observation, and that's kind of the key to designing V-carved inlays, and so the, this kind of the plane that I've denoted in there, that, that red dashed line, is uh, called the artwork plane. And that's really where you want your artwork to be the right size. And so when you design your little shapes or the designs that you're going for, that's, that's kind of the plane that you want to be the correct size. Because of the, this wedge, it'll be at different sizes at different depths. And so uh, the really the key thing to note is that inlay is, the V-carved inlay is formed above the uh, artwork plane, and it's also flipped over. So you got to make sure you mirror it, and it's also uh, above it instead of below, which I'll kind of get into how that, that uh, plays in the cam part. And then the uh, base pocket is formed below that, that plane. And so, uh, so both parts, it can be machined separately after you kind of uh, realize that uh, that uh, the inlay is above that plane and the base is below it. And uh, they can really be machined with just a standard V-carve. Uh. All right. So yeah, so the base can just be a standard, is cut with a standard V-carve uh, that used for any other design, not necessarily for uh, inlays. But the inlay itself uh, can be cut over by first flipping over the artwork. And then we have to inverse, we have to cut the way the inverse, so we have to leave kind of the, the proud, the part that we want to fit into the inlay. And the other part is you can leave a base of material below the inlay itself. And so that's where coming in, that's where it comes into play that you can hold a bunch of different inlays all together at one time and then glue them all in at once. Uh, but the trick is that the inlay, uh, oh, the inlays, so the inlay here is the shape of what you're trying to inlay is, needs to match at the bottom of that angle and not at the top. And so that's the real geometric trick is, uh, so then in the CAM, in, in Vectric software, that means you have to really do your V-carve at the, at the start depth of how thick you want your inlay. So that'll make more sense when I get to the other pictures, but that really is the key is you have to do the start depth is where you want to start at the thickness of the inlay. Okay, so, but to make this more practical, because if we just did exactly that, uh, they probably wouldn't fit exactly because there's always some uh, errors involved and we have to have room for glue. Uh, so we have to add a couple of different features to make this a little more practical. Uh, one is uh, adding a glue gap to the bottom of the base. And it also allows if you have some errors when you're inserting it into the uh, the part, this, will, this allows a little extra space. Uh, so we want to add that gap at the bottom. And, uh, how you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there, there was a question asked, uh, is there a specific flat depth that you need to use the V-carve bit or does it matter? Um, it's just as thick as you want your inlay to be. So if okay. you're doing something where you want the inlay to be really thick, 
then you just make that uh, deeper. Or if you're doing like coasters like I had done, then uh, for me, I did a tenth of an inch for the for the okay. Pistol. So it really just depends on, and, and if you have a, a wood that tends to chip out a thicker inlay, it might be easier. So what would you suggest the depth be on that? Uh, for uh, me, for a, like a three for quarter inch. Wood that would chip out like that? Uh, would you... Maybe a quarter inch or so would be plenty. Okay. Let's see. Next part is, so uh, the another thing is to add is, uh, so I had to think about is how to get the the backing of the inlay off after you're done, and uh, so it's I found it useful to add a gap between the inlay and the backing, and so uh, I may had to make this gap equal to a little bit more than the, my bandsaw blade. I used a bandsaw. Other people use a different method to uh, get that off, but especially for small parts, uh, if you just make that wide enough for your bandsaw to get into it. That, you can chop off the backing pretty easily after it's glued in. Yep, and so to do that, we just add some what's called flat depth in the V-carb. So we did a start depth before that determines your thickness of the inlay. If you add some flat depth, that just adds a little bit of gap um, between the inlay and the backing material. But I'll repeat that again in a little while, so if that doesn't make sense yet. Hopefully it'll help. But machining the base, uh, that's pretty standard. If you're used to doing any V-carves, you just set up your start depth of zero, and then you set a flat depth of zero. And then there's the flat depth. You just really pick uh, how deep you want your inlay and how big of a glue gap you want. So a glue gap of 0 0.05 inches is plenty. Uh, and then you just add on to that uh, what you want your inlay thickness to be. And then you just uh, cut it like any other standard V carve. Uh, but machining the inlay is the tricky part. So I'm kind of flipping it back over. And for this, this is where, so this is kind of the screenshot in uh, the Vectric software, is you want that start depth to be the depth of your inlay. So use the same value you used for the uh, base, and then add a value for the cutoff depth. So I added another tenth of an inch to allow the bandsaw to kind of slide in there. And I, did, and I added a little extra because I, I didn't want the bandsaw blade hitting up against the coaster. Since the coasters are pretty thin, I didn't have a lot of margin uh, when sanding if I kind of nicked the side of the coaster. So. Okay, so let me ask a question. Um, yeah. So that number, the start depth, the point one, and the flat depth, the point two, do they have to be the same number? Nope. Or they don't they have, be the same? Yeah, they don't have to be the same at all. So okay. Should, in this case, they happen to be uh, my inlay depth was point one and the cutoff was point one. But if I wanted to make either one of them bigger or smaller, that they're independent. So if a person wanted to do an inlay on a cutting board and mm -hmm. they knew a year down the road that is going to have a bunch of knife marks in it and they wanted to have the, the inlay deeper so that they wouldn't machine that off, they need to make that uh, flat depth uh, or the inlay depth deeper? Yeah, the inlay depth deeper. So that would be the start depth in this case. Yes. Okay. Yep, exactly. So are you guys clear on that? Yep. Okay. All right, so the thing to watch out for on this is that uh, V-bit, how, how large of a V-bit you have determines how deep all these can, can be. So there are some constraints on that. Uh, for the base, you just have to add your, uh, your total depth, which is the start depth plus the flat depth, uh, which in this case is just 0.15. You have to make sure your V-bit can cut that deep. So for these coasters, it was pretty easy, and I had only a quarter inch V-bit. So I didn't have any problems with this. Um, but the the inlay for me, since I was using a, a smaller V-bit, the start depth and the flat depth, so that came out to be a point, point 0.25. My V-bit was just a little over that. I think it, it could go a total depth of 
So that was that. This was pretty much the limit for my smaller uh, V bit. So you just have to watch out for that. Don't use. Don't go too deep, and then use a smaller uh, V bit. You're under trouble. Sorry, to keep interrupting you, but uh, I think these questions are coming up. Uh, you find it preference to use a 60 degree bit versus a 90 degree bit? Um, I used 60. Um, and I had good luck with it. I hadn't really experimented with the other angles much. Okay. I don't know if uh, Dave has experimented with other angles. If you want to chime in there, Dave, just turn your microphone on. Okay. But yeah, that's probably a good uh, thing to look into. Some other, so, some other angles might be better. Let's see. Okay, so a little bit of the CAD cam. Uh, this is really the goal of what you're looking for. Uh, to end up with your two pieces. Uh, the walnut is the base, and the maple is the inlay. And this is after I sand under them a little bit, because the, the inlay itself, when, when it comes out, it may have chips in the bottom, and, it, uh, and some of the wood might be chipped out. But really, if it's below the the plane where you want it to end up, the, where the artwork is, uh, you'll, they'll never see it. So it can have some chip out and it can be fuzzy a little bit on it. It, it really will uh, kind of go away. That's kind of why I like this method. It, it uh, hides some of that stuff. And then uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty neat feeling when you stick them together and they just it goes right in and you kind of feel it kind of lock into place. All right. so. How I did that was uh, in uh, in the Vectric software, import the artwork that's in the middle, that's the main part here. And then I added, just for the coasters, I added kind of some chamfers around the outside that I also V-carved and then just drew a circle around the outside. I don't know if you can see my, if you can see my mouse, this circle, this black circle really wasn't machined at all. It was just a reference that I used to, to uh, size the artwork. So all the coasters, the, the picture in the middle is all about the same size. Uh, for the cam on this, I used just a standard uh, 60 degree V bit uh, with the start depth of zero. And then the flat depth was equal to what I mentioned before of I used a uh, 0.1 for the inlay depth, and then another 0 0.05 inches for the uh, glue gap. And then I also did a profile on the outside with a standard uh, straight bit, and I also left tabs. So tabs for me were important in this case because I used them uh, later on to hold the piece when I was cutting it off with the bandsaw. So uh, if you're doing a larger piece, you wouldn't necessarily need tabs. Um, so kind of go by what you need in that case. But the base, this is pretty similar to any other uh, V-carving that you would do. Uh, and this is roughly what you're looking for in the simulated results. Uh, the inlay. So the first thing uh, you have to make sure you do is to flip it horizontally. I, After I got this far, I realized I picked a really bad uh, image because it looks almost the same horizontally or flipped as it does, uh, it's very, it has a risk. So, but anyways, this is the flipped version of the butterfly. Uh, and then you draw kind of a wide, wide area on the outside of this. So we need an extra border. So that way we cut kind of the inverse of the shape. And uh, so this also allows like a clearing out area that you can cut it out after you machine it. And so you can, uh, you can just have that, that thinner backing area. Uh, when, when you insert the inlay. Uh, so, and there's another, see, you'll see that I draw the, these extra kind of perimeters around the shape, and uh, those are really clearance boundaries. And so what I found is that if you just draw the one boundary around your shape, you can select the clearance option in the VCarve tool, and uh, it'll work just fine. But uh, for the clearance, it will, plunge down to the start depth plus your first pass. And so that 
very first pass could be three times what you're used to uh, using on a plunge or on a straight bit. And so uh, in some machines, that's no problem. In some uh, woods, that's no problem. Uh, but that's one of the lessons learned I learned uh, pretty quick is in that really hard woods, uh, that was too deep. And I had problems with that uh, with my machine. So I had to create my own boundaries where I uh, created my own pocketing tools. And so I couldn't use that automatic clearance tool uh, for the V-carve, just, just because I had that start depth that wasn't zero. So in here, the the blue lines are really the clearance lines that I used with a, a quarter inch end mill and just went around to clear it out really fast. And then the red line outside of the, the artwork is what I used as the border for the V-carve, V-carving. Uh, so the, for the cam on this, I would, uh, first I did a pocketing where I selected, you know, the very outside line and then uh, this inner line and then I just used a, uh, a quarter inch or so end mill, I think in this case, really, yeah, it was a quarter inch end mill, and then allowed that to pocket it down all the way to the depth of uh, where it would be the full inlay depth plus the uh, gap. So this was as deep as as I needed for the full inlay plus the gap. And uh, so by doing this, the start depth here is listed as zero, and so I can control how many passes and for each uh, for that tool much better than allowing the the V carve uh, tool path to decide that. That's the only reason I did that. If your machine can easily go through uh, wood without or hard woods in those cases, then you can kind of ignore this extra complication. And uh, so this is the setup for the inlay, the V carve inlay, and this is where you got to. This is kind of where you got to really pay attention and make sure you get it right and set the start depth is equal to the thickness of your inlay and then turn on the flat depth and add that gap for cutting it off of the backing material. So that's, this is really the, the uh, crux of the uh, method right here. And then after that, you uh, try to get this result. And so, uh, someone, uh, well, somebody posted a question on the YouTube uh, video, which was a good one, is how I determine those offsets. And uh, what I was really looking for is I wanted the V-carve, I wanted a couple passes that went all the way around the design, uh, just so I, kn I knew that it was completely V-carve. So I look in here to make sure all these paths are uh, all taken out. And all the way around the edge, there was none, no edges that didn't go all the way down to the bottom. So this whole edge was uh, kind of angled. And then the rest of it was just cleared out with the end mill. And so if you have this V-carved groove out farther, it's just, just, it's just the V-bit going around in circles, which takes a long time. So I tried to minimize that. Uh, but then but I didn't want to be too close to the, the edge where I didn't have a full angle all the way up the side of the inlay. So that's, that's really what I was looking for. Uh, okay, the machining. You guys are probably better at this than, than I was, but uh, it's fairly straightforward after you have the cam set up. Uh, you just zero out, zero out home, or home all the axes and set up your zero points, insert your bits. Uh, I use the, the bit specifically that I used was a quarter inch, 60 degree V bit. It was from precise bits. I listed the number there. And then uh, for the inlay, you, since it's a different material, I had to re-zero some of the axes and where it was located on the machine. And then I did a clearance pass with the upcut mill, then switched over to the V bit, and then I used the V car uh, pass. So, so that. And then the next steps for finishing are I uh, hand sanded the parts just to remove any excess chips so they didn't get stuck when I was uh, gluing in the inlay. And then I cut around the uh, inlay itself so you can see in the middle picture where uh, the, actually, well, I'm doing it in the, in the first picture, but the middle picture you can see the result is that the, the inlay itself is in the middle and then I just cut around where this clearance area was. And so there's none of the extra material on the outside, so, it's, so I can, 
easily uh, glue it in without hitting the other uh, box of wood that was around it. And I just used a uh, paintbrush to kind of brush in the glue. That worked pretty well. Uh, I also found that uh, I use that if you use tight bond three, it it dries to kind of a dark color, and so it kind of left a uh, line around the outside of the inlay. So uh, I found that tight bond two works better in that case. And though tight bond three is uh, more waterproof, if that's an important, uh, you can just put a different seal around the whole thing, and then uh, that that point doesn't uh, matter quite as much. All right, so then after the glue dries, uh, this is the part where the tabs paid off for me uh, in that I could leave the coasters in the, kind of that square stock and uh, then run it through the bandsaw to cut off that the backing of the inlay. That way you don't have to sand on the belt sander quite so much through all of the different uh, layers. Uh, so if you have a bigger project, uh, this can be done on the CNC machine as well. You could just set it up there and just have it skim off the top and uh, that would probably leave a nice surface and get rid of the top, and then you have even less sanding to do. So there's many ways to approach it, just depending on how big of an inlay and, and how big your piece is. And after that, I took it over to the belt sander and uh, tried not to sand off too many of my fingerprints. And uh, then I just hand sanded up to 320 and then applied uh, the wood finish. And it turned out pretty good. So I was pretty happy with these results. While you had it on the last picture with the uh, sander, it looks like you made yourself a little holder. Yeah, I, I uh, came up. I, tell us about that. Yeah, so I designed so after after sanding too many of my fingerprints, and they were pretty sore for a while. I uh, designed this kind of just a quick quick jig to hold the coaster. So it just had a little handle that I squeezed. Did you 3D print that? Yeah, and then I 3D printed it, and then it worked pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was really happy with my My fingers were very happy after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, cool thing about printing is you can do pretty much They'll build what you need when you need it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the results turned out good. Uh, everybody, all the family was happy with their Christmas presents. It just set the bar a little bit higher for next year's Christmas present. So that's always, yeah. that makes it always tough. Uh, so here's another picture. This was a uh, bread cutting board uh, that I did for um, my father-in-law. That was a, is a big hunter. So. Deer. And the circle in the board is for? Uh, it's for either hanging up or it can hold like a, a, a beer can. Dip, yeah, I guess that would dip in. The <laughs> okay. And so, okay, to the lessons learned, the stuff that's not in the video, sometimes it's good to include these things, but uh, the video is already getting too long. Do you guys know Pete Wilson? Pete Wilson is in the uh, in the group. Okay, I'll uh, allow him. It's, he's well, asking. It looks like he's not in the meeting right now. All right. Pete I think he's staff, so I'll allow him. Oh, look, uh, there he is. Okay, yep. There he is. All okay. Right. So lessons learned is this is the, one of the first times I was trying to do an inlay, and I was using, uh, let's see, this was Purple Heart. And purple art is really hard. And this is where I learned about the making my own clearance path. So what happened was is that the path was too deep for the quarter inch end mill. And uh, because the wood was so hard, it actually pulled the tool down out of uh, the chuck that I was using, out of the machine. And it went right into the spoil board and across my uh, aluminum tea rack for the head in there. Uh, so this, you know, gave me quite a good scare. Uh, you can see some of the, the pictures of the, the chips. And so that is really be 
because again, I mentioned that the, that start depth is greater than zero, and then on top of that, it takes into account the, your past depth. So for me, that was quite a bit deeper than I usually run a, a quarter inch end mill in such a hard wood as a Purple Heart. So that's and the other contributing factor was I uh, had been using up to that point a tool called Muscle Chuck. Have you guys seen any of that or anybody tried to use a, a Muscle Chuck? What it is is a uh, chuck that on your router that allows you to really quickly uh, swap out bits. And so with one hand, you can use this uh, wrench and just pop in bits, tighten them up with just a small little uh, twist. And uh, so up to that point, this thing had worked really good, and it was I could switch bits really fast. Uh, so I liked it a lot, uh, but it seems like either it loses its grip over time, or it just can't handle that uh, that hardwood at that depth. And so it pulled the tool out. Now I just use the the standard collet. But I like really liked this up to that point. But uh, man, it was uh, part of the contributing factor to that pulling out like that. Sean. Yeah. Uh, Ted and I attended the same CNC symposium in Connecticut, and we were specifically warned not to use this particular product just mm -hmm. for the experience you had. Hmm. Ah, that's interesting. Um, Sean, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, what do you want me to save them for at the end? Uh, either way. Okay, well, uh, one of the questions was, you know, on the spaceship, uh, was that yeah. individual parts or was that all one piece? Uh, it was all, so I did, it was separate parts, but they were on the same backing, so I glued it all in at the same time. Oh, yeah, okay, so you cut out individual parts, but you glued them in the same backing. So basically they were individual, the female was one part and the male was individual parts, what you're saying? No, uh, so the the uh, the male. Maybe you can back up to that. And all the parts were just raised up on that backing when you when you get done. My audio cut out for you. I don't know if it cut out for everybody else. Your your okay. audio cut out when you're explaining that. Okay, yeah, I'll repeat it. So so it ha it's they're both one part, but uh, so the inlay itself it has that thin backing that goes all the way across the whole uh, mm -hmm. surface, and so there's raised, raised up parts, and they can be completely separated from each other on that backing, and so it was really just one part, but it had different uh, raised areas, and so when you stick them together, uh, and then after you cut off the backing, then then they then it's separate pieces. But. Right, okay. So I think Fred, Fred Grover was asking the question, so I think the answer to that question is, you, you still do it the same conventional way, it just, after you machine it, it looks like it's separate parts. Yeah, well, well, actually, when you get done, when you when you get done machining, it's it's actually just just one piece. Uh, yeah, it's but, one piece, but it just looks like it's separated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then he had one more question here. Let me read it. Um, I'm not sure what he's asking. He was asking. Uh, something about uh, can they be these be done as welded text names? You, you know how you uh, yeah take a name yeah. and you weld them. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can either, you can they don't they don't even have to be welded. They can be uh, but they can be welded like in a cursive font where they're all connected. Mm -hmm. Or if or if they're or if they're not connected at all, it works for both uh, both kinds of. Okay. Continue on if you've got more. All right, I don't have too much more. Just the other inlay materials, I, I experimented a little bit with a few other ones, so I figured I'd share them. Uh, is well, I guess I only tried really one other uh, main material. Is uh, so there are other options for making them look like inlays, just like any other inlay. Is uh, I tried this resin uh, that with, and you can mix in different kind of pigments into it. And uh, then you don't even need to cut the inlay part. You can just uh, use the resin. And uh, so uh, I found it turned out pretty good. That's uh, some of the pictures, like here's a frog with the, the resin, blue resin inlay. Did you have problems with off-gassing with bubbles? 
Um, yeah, so I did a little bit, but I found that if you sprayed uh, isopropyl alcohol, this like a fine mist over the top, it uh, relieved. After the you poured the inlay, or before you poured the inlay? Uh, so, so this is is it? So after I filled in the inlay with the resin. Yep. Then I just uh, squirted it with a little squirter of the alcohol on the top, and it it got rid of all the bubbles on the top, and then ends wow, up. Wow, that's a, that's a technique I had not heard of. And that, that worked pretty good. And then I just I know some guys use a hair dryer to heat it up a little bit. And uh, I'm just wondering how this is amazing clear cast that you used. Yeah, yep, that's what I use. And I, I'm wondering, do you know the difference between that and the well, that is alumalite, but it's just a different product of alumalite, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's made by alumalite, isn't that? Oh, yeah. It's made by oh, yeah. It might just be their marketing term for it. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Well, Alumalite happens to be in Kalamazoo, is it not, Don? About uh, three blocks from the makerspace. Right, so, you got to be able to get good supply there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it worked. It was a lot of fun. My kids uh, liked, liked the coasters with the multiple colors. And then I kind of mixed uh, some of them, like the the rocket, the first uh, rocket ship, where I could do the, uh, the flames in red, but then have a maple inlay that so I sort of mixed. Uh, wood and resin, and those, those turned out nice. Yeah, Boy, here's, that's a, here's that's a unique, uh, a new, unique way to do it. And I think that's really the end of my presentation. So, well, great, great, great. Why don't we, uh, why don't we open up the microphone? So, any of you guys want to turn your microphones on and ask questions? Uh, Go for it. We'd uh, be happy to try to answer any questions. I have one. Okay, go ahead. The clearance tool on your uh, uh, on the the positive side. Uh, you said you had trouble because you had a uh, start point of whatever. Uh, would you really have to run that clearance path from uh, the same start point as the V-carve? Oh, you went in and out a little bit, but I think your question was, uh, if for the clearance path, do I really have to start it at the uh, at the start depth of the inlay? Uh, for, it seemed to be in the, if it was, was that the question? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah, it, it seemed to be uh, in the Vectric software that if you chose that clearance option with the VCAR pass all at once, that I, I couldn't find a way to make it uh, stop starting, to make it uh, to make it not start at the start depth. I didn't see any options to say, hey, I really want to start at the top of the wood and then make multiple passes down. It seemed to automatically start at the start depth. Uh, if anybody else knows a better way to do that than either uh, uh, VCAR Pro or Aspire, that'd be something I'd be interested in, too. And that, and then, yeah, and that's, that's the only reason I had to make those manual clearance passes. Okay, um, one of the guys is asking, uh, are you willing to share the files for those coasters for others to uh, use? Um, sure, though the trick might be the artwork I use, I, I, I think most of them I had, I've heard from like uh, some of the artwork websites, so those ones I probably couldn't share. Well, I, I'll, I I'll tell you what that. might work if, if this is possible, it doesn't cause you too much work, is maybe just share one coaster that doesn't have a purchased artwork. And okay. then that way they could practice with that technique, and once they learn that technique, then they could put their own artwork on it and do their own thing. Sure, sure. If you've got one of the coasters that has just generic artwork. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I, I think I have like a cat or something. That I think oh, got. sure. Yep. <laughs> well, I think everybody loves cats, so I think that'll work great. Yeah, my <laughs> daughter wanted to specifically wanted a cat. Uh, the other question was, I think I know the answer to it, was um, can Illuminolite be purchased at hobby shops? And Dave will probably know the answer to this. I think the answer is no. I think you have to buy 
alumilite directly from the manufacturer. Is that right, Dave or Don? No, you can buy it uh, directly in Kalamazoo, but you can get it at Hobby Lobby or Michaels. Oh, they both of those sell them, huh? Okay. And well, I if did you're going to buy it, and if you're going to buy it, go on to either Hobby Lobby's site or Michael's site and print out the coupon for 40% off on one item. Right. Save so, a lot of money. Okay, so here's what I've learned. And a lot of people probably already know this, but Hobby Lobby, Joanne Fabrics, and Michael's will honor each other's coupons. Hmm. So if you go into Michael's, or you go into Hobby Lobby, you can show any coupon. Now, Hobby Lobby has a coupon. You can just go on your telephone when you're standing at the cash register and type Hobby Lobby coupon, and it'll come right up there 40%. You hold the phone there, and they'll, and they'll scan it. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I don't have a coupon. And you always have it on your phone. Just go to Hobby Lobby's website and then hit coupons, and it's right at the top of the page. It's 40%. And whether you're in Michael's or... Joanne's, but like Don says, it's 40% off of the highest one item that you have in your bag. The other thing that you need to be aware of with Alumalite, it has a limited shelf life. So don't be like me and buy a gallon of it and think you're going to use it eight months down the road because it won't work. It, it spoils really rapidly. So only buy what you need for the period that you're buying, and then when you have another project, go buy some more. I better start making a bunch of stuff with it then. <laughs> yeah, look at it. It's got a shelf life. Now, I don't know about the clear cast, but the regular Lumalite does. Hmm. And uh, the only way that I, when I spoke with the Lumalite folks over there, when they came to our uh, workshop in Kalamazoo, uh, I specifically asked them about that, and he I said, how can you tell if it goes bad? And uh, they said, the only way you can tell is to um, go ahead and mix up a batch and see if it hardens. Hmm. And if it doesn't harden or it gives you problems or changes colors, typically what happens, what I'm told is, and I haven't seen this, is that it gets really thick and gummy. Hmm. So, so they they produce it and sell it right away. It's a, it's a quick turnover. <laughs> I could be wrong. I'm more like that. Probably I'm wrong, but I think it's got three months shelf life. Uh, you buy that in a pint? I I think I don't. They sell yeah. it in quart bottles, I think. Don't they, uh, Sean? Uh, mine was pretty small. It wasn't like a water bottle size. Eight ounces is the Michael's Hobby Lobby. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love. I really like the technique, and I've been wanting to do it for a long time. But I've always heard that you, know, you got to use a pressure cooker or something like that to try to get the air bubbles out. And I know a lot of guys um, with resins and epoxies, they'll use a hair dryer to try to get the bulb, the gassing to come off, and it keeps gassing for a half an hour or so. So I wasn't sure how the alumilite worked. So it's nice to hear that you know spraying that on there gets rid of most of the bubbles. Yeah, I, I just sprayed it and kind of misted it down there, and I didn't really didn't have any problems with it. I mean, I, I mean, afterwards, I I did still sand the the top, so you can sand it just like the wood. Right it's now, alcohol. I've seen is that isopropyl alcohol or is yeah. that denatured alcohol? Nope, just isopropyl isopropyl. And and you said you sprayed it. Did it come in a pump sprayer or what? No, I just found I found a little. My, my kids had a little spray thing they were spraying water with, and I just. Was, Oh, so it wasn't an aerosol though. It was just a pump. Uh, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't an aerosol uh, spray. Okay. It was a hand pump. Yeah, so just get a. You could buy a pump bottle at, at at Hobby Lobby or any of those places too. So, and it's nice. They're opening up. Must be a up NASA on. thing. What's that, yeah. Charles? But that must be a NASA thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, here's here's another question I've got. Let's see, I got couple more questions. Do the colored pigments come with the kits or do you have to buy them separate? Um, uh, they have kits and I think you can buy them separate. Yeah, I had to get them separately, the, the colors. 
Uh-huh. I, and you, you, I you found a bunch of colors or just like a more of one color. I know that these manufacturers each sell their own pigments, but I think they're all interchangeable. I've yeah. used I've used some of the Illumilite pigments in in West epoxies, and I've used West epoxy colors and other things, and so yeah. Yeah, I, I used a couple of these. Uh, they weren't quite this large of ones, I don't think. And believe it or not, they're little, little tiny. I mean, little tiny bottles, and they go for a long way. They last. They last a lot. Okay, they so not I'm okay. applying the aluminum light cast resin into a V-carb, does it just go into the carved area, or does it get outside and sand it off? Yeah, it, you, you overfill it, and you can sand it off. You want to make sure you overfill it. Yeah, yeah. I, I tried to get fairly close. I didn't go too much over because then it sort of. Uh, but yeah, then you just have more staining to do. But yeah, I, yeah, you definitely filled it up so it kind of had a little curve above the surface because it, when it when it dries, I noticed it also shrunk a little bit. Did you have to prepare the wood for bleeding? Uh, nope, I didn't. No. And uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question. Uh, mother of pearl is that is that material too brittle? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, not I don't sure. know either. I, I know that um, I've seen online in some videos that people will take uh, turquoise and other rock material and they'll crush it and they'll make it really really fine like a powder and then they'll mix that in with alumilite or other material. And so it gives it a whole different design, and that works. The problem with that is when it comes to sanding. So now you've got a rock material that doesn't want to sand, like the mother of pearl or something like that, and you've got the wood that's softer. So that's what you have to be careful of. Any other questions? Does that make the aluminum like? Does that uh, clog up your sandpaper when you're sanding? Uh, maybe if you did a lot of it, um, I probably did like a half a dozen or a dozen of them, and I didn't notice any big problems with the belt sander. It didn't really uh, clog it up too badly. Okay. Yeah. We're uh, we're pushing on eight o'clock, so we're nearing the end. Uh, does Anybody have any other questions for Sean? Or we can also answer uh, some questions about last month's um, vacuum table. Um, I know I made one, and I made a YouTube video um, of how it went on. So if you guys wanted to see that, you can uh, look at that YouTube video, and I kind of explain what happened. And then Don made one, but I don't think he's had time to test it. Waiting for the gasket material to arrive. Okay. That should be there in about two or three days. It didn't take very long to get it. So, um, hey, Ted, what kind of, uh, what do you use for the vacuum on your vacuum table? I use my vac, my, my test tool vacuum. Okay. I use my test tool vacuum table. Uh, they're asking me about uh, the video. Let me, I'll pull it up. Oops. I'll, I'll pull it up. Uh, you guys still got Sean's screen up there, right? Yeah. You want okay. to take it back? Leave, no, leave your screen up there for a minute. And then I will uh, pull up my video and I will put it up on the screen just so guys can uh, copy the link and, uh, and know where to go to get it. So... Let me see here. Um, I'm going to turn my sound off just for a minute. Okay, I got the link now, so um, I need to uh, 
let's see, I need to put up some kind of a uh, notepad or something. Let me see if I can get a notepad. Did you turn the screen back over to me? Uh, I can. Okay. okay, hold on just for a second before you do that. And I will get a notepad up here and I'll paste the link. Well, I don't know if that will help people very much because it's kind of hard to copy the link. Um, uh, what, about, what about if you put the link in the uh, in the email you send out with the link for the video? Yeah, that's what I'll – well, but I don't send that out to everybody. I only send it out to the people that request it, but I can. Um, how, about, how about put it in yeah. the chat window? Yeah. Oh, okay. Why don't I do that? That's a great, great idea. Okay, let me do that. I'm gonna now we got people thinking. Okay. So here we go. So all there it is right there. It's in the chat window. Okay. But uh, I will try to win I'll try to uh it's it's YouTube. If you go to my YouTube, which is I don't know, you have to type my name in YouTube, I guess, whatever, and you'll find it and it's under vacuum table. But I don't think the chat, when we do the recording and I, people ask for the link to the recording, I, the pictures you know, across the bottom, all these bubbles and stuff that you see with the guys' names and who's in the, who's in the meeting, none of that copies in the, in the um, recording. And the chat, none of that re copies in the recording. The only thing we're going to get is uh, John's presentation. So, so let me see. You know, I can type it in here if you want while you're if you want it's it's up in the chat. Can you see it in the chat? But yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can I can also maybe uh open up like a word process or something like that and put it and put it in there and uh, why don't I do that? Uh okay. Why don't you go ahead and turn turn the presentation back over? Oh, okay, there you go. Oh, perfect. Okay. And that's, on, and that's on the vacuum table from last month. Okay, so um, why don't I go ahead and stop the recording. And then if anybody else has got any questions uh, before we say goodbye, uh, we appreciate everybody coming. And we'll do this the first Tuesday of next month at 7 p.m. Eastern time. All right. I have a question. Okay. So I have a project that uh, I'm carving out a, a caboose on, and it's going to be – posted in the outdoor elements so i purchased uh cedar wood to carve it out on i will be doing uh some painting on it. it's going to be a red caboose but okay. they want leave the wood uh natural wood behind it so um as far as painting uh <coughs> I, I typically, when I do a full sign, I, I stain the whole thing with a sealer, but because they want to leave uh, the wood natural behind it, I'm not sure exactly how to finish it. With Somebody gave me an, uh, an idea of using Super Deck clear coat to clear the whole thing and not put a, a, a sealer on before I paint it. So I guess I'm looking for ideas on how to finish that. Well, I'll tell you what I normally do is I normally try to put the sanding sealer on before I paint anything. <clears throat> that stops the paints from bleeding into the wood. So I try to coat everything with a sanding sealer. And then and then from that point I go ahead and put the different you know, sealers over the top of that, whether it be, you know, varnish or if it's just, uh, you know, spray lacquer or whatever you want to use. Oh, okay. So you put the sanding sealer on first, then yep. you put your colored paints on, blue, green, black, yep. whatever. Yep. And then so if you put a sealer on your wood first 
and you can either use the can or you can use the spray. And uh, and then once you've got the sealer on, then that stops your different colors uh, from you know bleeding into the wood. Uh, Bill Chapman is really good with finishes. He might have something more to say about it than me. Okay. I don't know if he wants to speak up or not, or if his microphone's working. I see Dave turn his head and look at him, but Bill doesn't seem to be wanting to move. <laughs> <laughs> hey, their their microphone might not be working. Okay. All right. Well, at least gives you some idea. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, just one last note before I uh, turn off the recording and, and go. Um, if th I, I really want to thank Sean for taking his time and what what a nice presentation he did tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, if any of you guys know of someone that you think is uh, you know has a little bit of information to share or wants to talk or help us out, uh, get in touch with them and see if they want to you know. Help us, uh, you know, continue to learn from each other. Maybe we can get them on here. Uh, I asked Dave's friend uh, today, uh, Father Ed, to see if I could get him to uh, come in and uh, and talk with us. But uh, he's got obligations on, on Tuesday night, so he had to decline. But uh, we're always looking for people that uh, might be willing to share what they know. Thanks again, everybody. I hope everybody has a great night. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Sean. Okay. Yeah, you're Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it.